see you all, whoever will listen to this talk, where you are and when it will be and fits your time. Today I would like to talk about geoethics, bridging, geostem and social sciences. If you never heard about geostem, that's right, because I invented this term for this conference to have a right uh, application. I'd like to thank some colleagues of mine because this is a collective effort what I'm presenting. What is the purpose of this talk? Is to introduce a philosophical school of thought, which calls itself geoethics, which is in the last decade emerging within Earth sciences. And for those who are from the field, for me, geostem is Earth sciences, but I thought that geostem, so geo, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is for many non-Earth sciences, a better acronym as anything else, which came to my mind uh, so far. So that's the structure of my talk, these seven points which you can read there. And I have two statements which I would like in the beginning. First, I would read a definition of geostem, something which is a little bit more academic, namely earth sciences is a range of applied and fundamental research fields, as well as related engineering disciplines and commercial undertakings. Together, they address the functioning of the Earth, the intersection of Earth and human systems, as well as the extraction and use of abi abiotic natural resources. Warning, this is a philosophy talk. Why doing philosophy? Because philosophy is not about truth. Philosophy is about the science to engineer your thinking. Possibly for this statement, I get beaten from several philosophers, up, but, but that's my approach to it. Geoethics, many of you possibly would go to a Wikipedia and you find a text there, which I will not read to you. Uh, I underwrite some phrases, so relates to interaction of human and, and with world physical, with our physical world in general, and I encircle some notions uh, which are increasingly makes me puzzling. For example, I would never write recognition of humankind duties and responsibility towards the earth system because I don't understand what are humankind's duties on, on, that, uh, on that level. Introduction further, geoethics all azimut. That is taken from the uh, internet side of the International Association for Promoting Geoethics and it writes geoethics as uh, follows. So I only highlighted the active verb. So geoethics provides something, reflects, encourages, deals, fosters, aims, promotes, highlights, aims again, and a lot of stuff in between. So my take home message is geoethics means being aware of the societal context of geostem. And that's in the nutshell why we talk about social sciences on one side and geosciences, geostem, earth sciences on the other side. To give you some high level uh, introduction. First, the notion human niche. Human niche is the planetary network of twin natural and cultural landscapes. That's the world in which we are living. That is the world which we are factually bundled together through our global supply, supply chains, which we recently altered and altered the niche. And what we are just these weeks uh, witnessing with the uh, war in the Ukraine and related uh, sanction measures, we're just breaking up global supply chains, structure them differently. And that means we will structure our living niche in a different manner. Geoscientists, which means the experts in geostem disciplines, are co-shaping the development of the human niche. I will come to that uh, later, give it a little more substance. And geoethics in this context is about what I call here the cultural substrates, for example, values, interest, historical development, you name it, whatever describes societal context. In a graphical manner on the left side of the screen, you see geostem I see at the intersection between culture, economy, and engineering. Further part of the introduction. 
to get a feeling, if you Google bioethics, you find uh, 54 million hits, geoethics, uh, 93,000. So it's more than two orders of magnificent difference. So we really talk about something which is niche. When you go into Google Scholar, you find this uh, frequency of hits of papers which mention geoethics. The oldest ones are all wrong because they are in the database with wrong publication dates. And then uh, you see a development over mainly over the last decade uh, that shows uh, how this subject has evolved, how um, more papers were published using the word geoethics. If you go to other liter literature base and not the very wide Google Scholar, accounts are an order of magnitude lower, the tendency is the same, and the first ever paper, first ever published paper in Nature in G about geoethics is from Monk and Brookert in 2020. Uh, open a sideline, the red dot. Uh, there's some dedicated use of geoethics in geography with a completely different meaning as I will use it in the uh, following. I have to clean my screen a little bit. So, so you find an introduction uh, a definition of geoethics on the website of the ERPG. I start reading its beginning. Geoethics consists of research and reflection on the values which underpin appropriate behaviors and practices wherever human activities interact with the Earth system. I like this very first phrase. There are over the time coming additions to it. If you go through the additions, you will see one starts from thinking about responsible science, what is responsible science, and is now more in a field where one is about scientific culture, for example, the very, very last edition, geoethics, the tool to influence the awareness of society regarding problems related to geo resources and the geo environment. So finally, as introduction, geoethics initially was conceived by geoscientists for geosciences for professional purposes. 2016, there is an important step of, formally, of formulating it. This is the Cape Town Statement of Geoethics, uh, formulated at the International Ge Ge Geological Congress in Cape Town. And there, more or less, is the time window where my own interpretation of geoethics evolves, which you find summarized in the bottom in the blue print. This is for me a combining uh, a way of thinking which brings together to be actor-centric, virtue-focused, responsibility-focused, geoscience knowledge-based. You see the parentheses around geo because it's more than in the world and geoscience, all actor inclusive and universal rights uh, based. You may have already noticed in passing that normally I put at the bottom of my slides some literature references when you would like to read more about that uh, subject which I talk. So let's, deep, let's dig into the matters. First, we have to think a little bit about uh, what are the socio-historical contexts of geostep? Because this is a typical European post-medieval intellectual development. When you go into the science, you find a very early engagement in European cultures with scientific studies of the earth. Mining, mineralogy is one example. Then you see over the centuries, emerging from science, research, engineering, economic, and applied into, into a complex societal venture, which in the end empowered European cultures to go for global hegemonic societal practices, to mobilize a genetic, physical, mental, and economic resources, and you can read uh, about it. For the Jews who know German, I would recommend Reinhard, Die Unterwerfung der Welt. For English, Mokir, a culture of growth, very important. And uh, for those who like it in French, could turn to Fresso 
l'apocalypse joyeuse, l'histoire des risques technologiques. Continuing these European contextual models give the geostem disciplines a socio-historical foundations because these European cultural models work only if you have an implicit understanding of the functioning of Earth, of the functioning of our planet. And quite often people are not aware of these that they have this understanding. It's deep built in in the professional disciplines. Nowadays, keyword Anthropocene on the left, right, we are recognizing that we are bringing the globe to a different state of uh, functioning. There's a proposal from Earth system science originating to add a new part to the geological time scale, which is called Anthropocene. That's in discussion since 2009 and likely will, in, will be in discussion for a couple of years longer. And if most of you think about uh, climate change as the most striking example of global change, I invite them to look on the global nitrogen cycle, which is even a more dramatic uh, change of the natural system which we are doing. And it does not start somewhere diffuse with a steam engine somewhere. No, it's in stands with the industrial nitrogen fixation before World War I. And uh, from there, the ball rolls on. So putting aside whether the uh, geological sciences finally agree on having the, at the end of the geological time scale, a Koch called Anthropocene, this notion is out, this message is out, and effectively, the earth science communities are at the center of discussion about the relation between human society and nature. And if you don't believe that, uh, don't see this immediately, think about global anthropogenic climate change happen without geoscientists finding codes, oil, mineral, or forecasting weather for shipping the commodities around the globe, or estimating natural hazards for infrastructure, including down to the stability of the foundation of the building we are currently sitting in. And I learned from Alberto that he is in Vienna, and I'm damn sure that this building is not earthquake proofed. And so the people looking into the functioning of the globe working in Vienna don't build the building for earthquakes. If you would be in Athens, the situation would be, would be different. I think this is very striking, showing that geostem is in anything which we are doing. It is deeply percolated into our ways of knowing and our ways of uh, functioning. So, looking at the socio-historical context of geostem, and being geoethical in that context means you have to have a view on natural processes, socio-political drivers, cultural ethical features of the human niche, and in modern terms, searching for alternative of the given development test. Certainly, geoethics offers answers to that, but geoethics also has competitors. They come under the labels of Mother Earth, Gaia, the good Anthropocene, or eco-modernism, and you can go through the, through the literature uh, to find other uh, philosophical concepts than geoethics. Here, the main message is, uh, when you look on the development in other STEM disciplines than geosciences, you can look on several decades, even a century back, on reflecting about the ethics of these professions. In geosciences, it is relatively recent. I don't know why, but it is relatively recent, and therefore geoethics Ethics is a relatively recent field. Turning page, the term geoethics, who, when, and where it be used. 
in the geoscience community, you find it about uh, 20 years ago, first very timidly, timidly mentioned in some uh, conferences. You find it in other domains. For example, there is a nice article on political science from Stoddard and Convert, peripheral visions towards the geoethical of citizenship, and nothing to do with geosciences, but uses against the same work. So even when you look now on the geosciences that, okay, is there one common terminology? No, you find similar thinking, uh, which goes with the notion geo, geologic, geographical ethics, and there are different distinguishable uh, school of thoughts. I'm personally, I'm cooperating with the EAPG. I'm a member of the board of experts. So my use of this term is tainted, uh, tainted by that uh, community. So if you talk to people about geoethics, they quite often have a very spontaneous reaction because the term can be understood. Ah, ethics is about what you should do. And geoethics means therefore, so what you should do to the globe. So it's a kind of buzzword. And uh, one can be happy or unhappy about it, um, but it is out, it is used, but it is not a unique identifier. So now, against all this background, what's geoethics as a philosophy in geoscience is about? It is a way of thinking, which is at the intersection between sustainability ethics, environmental ethics, and professional ethics. When you look in the documents, you can summarize geoethics is about the virtuous and responsible individual who pursues a practice that is geoscience knowledge based, just, equitable, inclusive, participatory, and ecological oriented. And when you would like to read this up, you go to this paper from Pepoloni, Bilham, and Di Capua, Contemporary Geoethics within the Geoscience. Basically, Geoethics at its origin <coughs> is about responsible geostem. When we think what are the central tenets, they are the five or six, which I already mentioned some slides ago. When you look how they get formulated, you, there is an application from 2014 called Geoethical Promise, which is more for educational purposes. You have the Cape Town statement on geoethics, which I already mentioned. And I have here centrally on this slide four papers, which take a different view what geoethics uh, means. Quite often, geoethics goes with uh, affective and aspirational associations, which irritates some. What you find on that slide is a quote from a review one of the open review processes where the reviews are published together with the paper, and I like to read it out. The whole thing, geoethics, that's the reviewer writing, consists of an idealist-based approach. According to such approach, the word is idealized as a sum of individual atoms deprived of any social character and of any capability of social and collective actions, but rather their possibility to act upon society is restricted only to their actions as individuals. There's obviously not even a single word about the structural determination upon individuals in the practical form of social organization where they live. So uh, it goes longer on this review. It's very interesting to read. It was clear for me from which philosophical positions it was formulated, but it's a very valid uh, question behind that. So what are these the socio-cultural contexts of geoethics which is promoted as it is givenly promoted? It's a genuine product of European cultural models. So it's European philosophies who shape geoethics. You find it, for example, very nicely uh, depicted uh, how culture and nature are put one against the other. And when you look on the foundations, how the philosophical foundations, how the analysis is done, 
the cultural domain, we use idealistic philosophies. In the natural domain, we use materialistic philosophies. We play with the cultural nature dichotomy. This is European to the very roots. And when you go back to the definition, you find it there. Appropriate behaviors and practice wherever human activities, one side, interact with the earth system. This is the cultural, natural dichotomy, which is typical for the European cultural uh, models. So geoethics draws on Aristotelian and Kantian models initially, makes so far no reference, not any reference to any other uh, philosophical foundations which outside Europe, African Ubuntu culture, Buddhist, Chinese, Indian or Islamic cultures. And it started as professional ethics, it's about professional concerns, it's good for geosciences, geosciences, European Union, uh, European, cu European culture's origin. And geoethics was conceived initially as a virtual ethics with a responsible and geoscience knowledgeable individual as a central tenet. That's good, but limited. Geoethics has some other features uh, which are very interesting to explore. If you go into geoethics and you look for a certain type of normative framework, utilitarian ethics, Rawlian ethics, no reference made to these formal networks. There is uh, on the other side, and that finds its uh, roots in the professional experience of the people who are formulating it, that what is in one context, a sound ethical pra practice, may in a different socioeconomic context, environmental context, not be a sound ethical practice. So it's a certain pluralism by design, which is limited by individual accountability, and see very strict claim to use a scientific uh, knowledge base only. So geoethics is constrained by a scientific knowledge, but recognized it's context dependent, that is context dependent in space and time, has a strong awareness of technical, environmental, economic, cultural, and political limits existing in different socio-ecological contexts. You find that at the source given. Against that background, uh, two developments have been possible in the last uh, decade. First, to explore how geoethical thinking might evolve from something which serves geoprofessionals into something which may support citizens when intervening into the earth system. And the second development, which was possible, bringing in the understanding of global anthropocentric uh, change to take geoethics as a reflection about governance. So moving away from the individual human agent to the collective and institu institutional uh, human agent. So summary, as I see it now, uh, geotics labels a philosophical school situated at the intersection of sustainability ethics, environmental ethics, and the little stiff term, the ethics of societal practice of citizens. And in this context, uh, the professional ethics of geoscientists is a special application case. So geoethics is a school of thinking vision geostem. The design of geoethics does not limit it to a discipline specific application, and the label geoethics may serve as a more generic semiotic sign. Geoethics emphasizes the societal use of geoscience expertise because geostem disciplines are paramount for sustainable stewardship of the human issue. As a semiotic sign, Geoethics refers to the widespread geoethical practices in any society dealing within the human issue. So, and I think we cannot away 
walk away from this responsibility to take stewardship of planet Earth. And that's why geoethics bridges geo STEM and social sciences. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And the publication mentioned at the bottom of the slide is the most recent application of this way of thinking and trying to combine understanding Earth, understanding nature, understanding human societies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. That was very inspiring indeed. And if you don't mind, I would not close here, but I would like to follow up with, uh, I think, more than a question, in fact. I, I would like to almost ask you to develop this thinking in a specific direction. What I mean by this is that it, this talk is very clear as, as in, you know, where the idea comes from and uh, uh, even looking at it from the outside, even though you yourself a practitioner of geoethics, you, you help us contextualize it in the context of European culture, like you say, and the, 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 the duality between uh, humans and, and the planet. But uh, I would like to go a bit deeper into then what? So how do we operationalize this? And you know, I come from the social sciences myself. I'm not a geo, geo science, uh, uh, geoscientist. A, a, a common friend and colleague, Marco Manca, who has served as our, and when I say our here, I mean at Riders, he served as our main ethics consultant in research. He likes to say that ethics is not really about the rules and the process that you follow, the processes that you design. It's more about the action that you take when things go wrong, as they sometimes do. And here, I, I would like to start from this. You, you have been uh, uh, using a lot of uh, positive words for geoethics, and by positive I mean descriptive. So I, I, I hear you saying exploration, I hear you saying awareness, and uh, what I'm, I'm, I would like to ask you is, okay, but what about the action part? So once you are aware of the, of the social and economic uh, context in which uh, the planet exists, then what do you do? What, what 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 are your actionables? What are your what are the implications of that? This question is right because otherwise this is uh, geoethics is just an academic uh, exercise when it is generalized for use by citizens. Uh, the use which in professional context. Uh, the use cases range from how I treat my peers, how I handle diversity, how I interact with local user communities, for example, when I open, operate, and close a uh, mine site. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that is, but this is responsible science. This is maybe even corporate responsibility, uh, and it would not qualify the word geo. Uh, if it was not be only to label, okay, we don't talk about what else, we talk about this dead stuff, which is not really uh, interesting uh, for many. Therefore, uh, I tried to push things uh, forward. And the recent paper, which I published together with uh, Eduardo Marone, uh, uses this uh, framework of uh, thinking I, to distill uh, some political guidance uh, saying, okay, when we would like to tackle global change, what we need is a policy uh, which gives the local human agent autonomy. So we call for societal processes which enable the directly concerned people to take action. 
to get involved in what they are, what their future is. So it's about, um, yeah, quite general, quite conventional, uh, quote, in conventional uh, political uh, value. And we do this by combining uh, geoethical thinking with the political philosophies of Jonas, Kohlberg, and Bunger. Takes it just as label what it uh, what, what it means for them. So we come up with autonomy as keyword. We come out with uh, trustworthiness. So how a human agent should behave in order to gain the trust and keep the trust of his peers. And we say, okay, we need a society which has a scientific culture and a culture of inclusive justice. That means starting from uh, from a, a geoetic thinking in a professional sphere, we said, okay, we need a society which empowers the human agents, which cares for behavior in the society that mutual trust is built, which cares about scientific culture, meaning knowledge-based, which means basically knowledge has to be reproducible. So the method, uh, yes, I build, I test, I check the knowledge on the other side, and not I believe something because some authorities uh, tells me. And I have a culture of inclusive justice, which means I am concerned about the others. I try to bring them on board. I have participatory uh, political uh, processes. And I'm aware that things have to be in, uh, done in a manner which is justifiable. Uh, we had in a recent publication um, a paper published on climate change where the researcher proposed, let's do the following deal between developing countries and the developed countries. The developed countries in the end have a debt in the carbon which they have pushed in the atmosphere. So since the 19th uh, century. The developed, uh, the, the developing countries have currently a very high economic debt which they asked to pay back. In order to find a political agreement, the proposal was let's cancel both debts at a common reference date. So let's say we take 2015, when we discuss policies about mitigation and adaptation for climate change, we don't load it with the reflection, ah, you have pushed so much the atmosphere over the last century. And the counterpart is any depth which is older than 2015 is wiped out. So that's... Uh, one can question whether this is just, but it is in the end is a practical deal, a practical offer which can be made. And that would be for me, for example, expressing first, I take everybody on board, inclusive justice, past generation, present generation, future generation, global south, global north. Uh, I build it on an understanding Scientific understanding the stamped carbon uh, hits the entire planet. So this is easy knowledge base. I try it, uh, bring it in the process which led to the Paris Agreement, which is in the end a moment of collective global uh, trustworthiness. People trusted each other that knowing that all the political dealings which were around, it was was a high moment uh, moment of trust. And when we set a starting point like that, uh, we can then far easier call on the actions of everybody. For example, the stamped Germans who try to drive high speeds over the motorway and not get down to uh, 100 kilometers per hour, which would cut uh, several percent out of our uh, annual carbon, carbon budget. So that is for me an, uh, an example to apply uh, geoethical thinking. And what we did in the paper which I quoted is we looked on experiences from uh, COVID-19, uh, looked on the likely situation which is uh, will come in by sea level rise, uh, saying okay what can we learn from one 
for the other. So what are the policies, policy advice, which can be given? And we filtered the policy advice, the policy experience from uh, COVID-19. We've filtered through a geoethical lens in order to make some comments on uh, what likely will be happen uh, in 100 years when we have to find new living places for uh, four out of five Dutch and two out of uh, two out of three Belgians and we have several hundred thousand uh, northern Germans and um, and so forth and so on so far and uh, we have to find places of living them for somewhere else. so uh, I know there are far more drastic problems with sea level rise Bangladesh uh, entire small island states are disappearing but uh, to bring the problem into our context. And as these things develop on a hundred years time scale, and we are certain that they will be developed in this way, we could genuine ask, what is a cultural policy? What is an economic policy? What is a social policy in Northern Germany, for example, saying, okay, we give up defending shorelines, all but some important ports, and you have your house there, fine, but don't believe that your children will be living there because the dikes will break and we will not take the cultural efforts which it took the last thousand years in order to get the uh, dikes uh, stabilized. And we will have similar discussion for the nice shores in the Mediterranean coast of Italy which will be simply gone and the beaches will not be sandy, but stony and rocky and the water will, will move uh, inland. So that's, uh, these are for me at least some example how to go, how to apply geoethics. And basically geoethics is a no magic at all package. No silver bullet no never thought about idea how to behave in a conscious manner we take best political science and philosophy advice from the last century we took best understanding of how this planet works and we try to bring this thing uh, together and say people please people try to be reasonable try to be understandable and uh, apply common common sense and from that going forward to an uh, actionist of people who are would like to do something on a very concrete uh, example i have an, in the book which i organized uh, during uh, the pandemic there is an article in from Claire Nelson, who is a former engineer, uh, UNESCO activist, uh, about uh, how people behave badly, trying to uh, think about uh, getting carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, putting tons of certain kind of rocks on the beach in the uh, Caribbean, not thinking about the mayor, and she calls on that for a different kind of educated leadership in order to bring things uh, things forward. So that is for me about uh, geoethics. Geoethics, the nonsense, non nonsense sense, bringing uh, best given understanding together on one side, anchored in uh, geoscience understanding and one side anchored in social science, understanding how our uh, societies uh, function. And it's not about silver bullets. No, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm just hearing you and um, still, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that the, the, the key point here is that we who are not practitioners like you are, we tend to think of earth sciences as, as pure sciences. So somebody does the math and say, well, 
uh, if uh, Ant Antarctic glaciers uh, yeah. I'm listening. Into, the, into the sea, then you'll have a sea level rise by so much, uh, and then you can draw a map and see how much land you're going to lose, uh, where you're going to lose it. End of the story. Now the economists move in and say, OK, we need to make provisions for that. What do we do, etc. But also it is true that, uh, in fact, the earth sciences are very applied. Like you said, they, they in fact enabled um, the Anthropocene in a way. No? So it's not some earth, earth sciences are doing the modeling, but others are building the dikes. <laughs> And so th there is a, a, a triage work to be done. And this, uh, it, it makes a, a ton of sense that this uh, triage work would be done in a, in a holistic way. So uh, taking into account uh, uh, things like population density and uh, economic significance, you mentioned important ports, they will probably still be defended when, when the sea levels start rising and, uh, st and, and stuff like that. So I am I in the right ballpark here? So is it the case that now we are planning large scale, some, some small scale too, but also some large scale interventions that do require applied geosciences? And these, they need to be filtered through the filter of human settlements and human communities and human happiness so that cho difficult choices can be made. Is this where we are? Yes. As I, uh, once in a while I like uh, to say, when you would like to work in a company, you do a master of business administration. When you would like to run a planet as we are doing, then you need a master in geoscience. And uh, I have here to, pulled it out of my library, um, a book, which is, uh, let's see whether I can get my screen large. Yeah, uh, see what I'm showing a bit. Uh, it's, so. it's getting eaten up by your- uh... Background, yeah. Yeah, now, now yes, I can see. Uh, so. So this is in German, so it's an interesting language, but it's a minority language. Uh, the title is The Birth of Geoengineering. And it talks about uh, collaborative big engineering projects of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Panama Channel, for example. The channels uh, in the Alps, another example. Uh, so, uh, and those people who talk today about geoengineering would never say, okay, that's, that's our beginning already. We are doing it. So what I say is this earth science applications is so deep in our daily doings, in our in many professions integrated that we are not perceiving it as this. But if you would take it out, our buildings would collapse. Uh, if you would take it out, our shipping over the ocean would be um, unreliable at best. Or why did Mr. Uh, Columban went to the Canary Islands? Because he had the understanding that there were on a global scale, the winds from the east to the west, and he can, can, can uh, get his sailing boats uh, westward, and then he had to move a little bit north, and then he, had to, and then he came back uh, with the Westerlies. So this was deep understanding how the planet uh, functions. You have the same for the mining engineers in the middle, in the uh, 17th century. So this is, and this is in, I think this is a tremendous cultural discovery for those who, of us who study this culture, seeing, okay, ah, wow that's academic, we see it on one side, but it's deeply in our practice. And those who study uh, science uh, have to answer the question, why is the perception that geosciences is so unpractical? Why is it only academic? 
Do you know who is the most courage scientist? The most? The most courageous scientist. Courageous scientist. Is the metrologist, which at eight o'clock goes on the t TV screen and tells tens of billion of million people how the weather will be to tomorrow. Yeah? A subject where everybody depends on, where everybody has an opinion on. And this guy tells it will rain on your barbecue. Hmm? <laughs> so, or oh, it will not rain on your barbecue. Well, when it rains on your barbecue, we see thunderstorm, which comes two hours earlier than other. You blame this guy having done the wrong uh, forecast. Tell me any other profession who has this courage to go on the evening and tell people uh, that will be the weather. And what is behind that? There are 200 years of observation of astrology. There are first hand-drawn maps 100 years ago. There is the emerging of using weather forecast in the Second World War. There is the first use of uh, gigantic numerical computers to make forecasts huh? in the 1950s. So there is, a, and then there is, for example, a fantastic conference in Brussels in 1863, very close to your place in Brussels, where people around the globe sat together, convened by Belgian scientists to agree on a manual, how on ships one should record weather records, weather observed six o'clock in the morning, that and that. And then for decades, even centuries, this was uh, this, this was running. And you tell me, earth sciences is academic? No, it's damned practical. It's very damned practical. Huh? So, and that the difference comes before we starting make the Anthropocene. We could allow to have an image of these geologists going out on the field side and taking some rocks here, taking them rocks there. There's the oceanographers who measure a little bit of salt water here, measure a bit of salt water, water there. Because we were as humanity not as strong enough uh, to change this globe. And that we're doing now. That we're doing now. So, uh, and that uh, projects earth sciences away from the ivory tower, where they never have been, as we have discussed, where they have been seen to be. Huh? And therefore, in order to be a responsible uh, social scientist, you need to two years additional program, your master in earth sciences, in order to understand what you are, what you are doing. Indeed, uh, and, and uh, it, it, well, while I, you were talking, I thought that maybe the cyber tower idea is relatively recent, maybe, you know, 17th century or so, because the first science were earth sciences, no? Yeah. You had the Egyptians measuring the floods of the Nile, you had the Romans building these giant aqueducts that made a, a, a metropolis of one million people possible. Exactly. Well, not enough water or food for one million people before they decided to build all these gigantic public works 2000 years ago. So, yeah. draining swamps, another example, you know, you name it, terracing cultures for rice in places like Thailand or Indonesia or. Uh, yeah. That's, so, and, and that's why at the beginning of my talk, I give this small academic description what geosciences are. I can try to bring it up, up again, but I think it's, I lost it somewhere here and now. So that's, uh, so when, from a hist perspective of history of science, uh, it is a very interesting question, why one could believe that this is something academic stuff now for some wired people who go out in, in the field. Possibly it was, uh, this idea came up because it was already so deep in the practical life of the engineers, of the architects, of whatever you, you call it, that these chefs could go off and collect some rocks, that these chefs could go off and take some, uh, take some water, water, water samples. Huh? So because society had 
already internalized this this know-how, applied it daily. Huh? And as I said during the talk, uh, think about what would our world, if you're not some geologist to find some coal, some oil, some gas, some uranium, huh? think about the metrologist, I think about global transport, if I were not metrologists doing waves and storm forecast, huh? your ships would never be there where you were expecting them. And um, your, those in, engineers who look in the foundations of the building where you are in and say, okay, dear guys, let's do it a meter deep. This is this uh, soft uh, Belgium yellowish uh, thick layer of sand. And we have to dig a little bit deeper and put some stronger foundations in. Then it stands. It stands in Brussels. It does not stand in um, Mexico City, where the same ground is. Because in Mexico City, uh, it's an earthquake region. And if the soil which you have in this kind, which you have in Brussels, is amplifying the movements. So you have to make your building even stronger in order uh, that, they, that they stand. But these disciplines, the building engineers, would not claim they do earth science. Well, maybe they don't do science, but they apply earth science. This is very deeply in our uh, um, way of doing. And this combined with what is the uh, European development of the last 500 years, uh, where in the, in the end European powers conquered world, bringing with this a way of thinking, a way of functioning, uh, geosciences as part of the, of, of the package. And I'm Portuguese, we made it around the tip of uh, South Africa, huh? turning Cape Horn and going into the uh, uh, Indian, in, Indian country. So let's call it a day, let's call it a talk. Uh, absolutely. I, I have one more question. Yeah, please. We don't have time. Um, and my question is, is picking up on your, uh, at some point you mentioned participation. You said part of being geoethical, doing geoethics is look for participatory solutions. And, and I was, I, I would like to expand a bit more on that because, uh, yeah, I mean, not, not all of us have knowledge of, of, geo, of the geosciences. We don't have a master on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on geostem. So, but we still need to need, do need to run a planet unless we embrace a, a sort of technocratic approach, which doesn't seem to be what you want to do, you and your colleagues, I mean. And so uh, can, you, can you, again, elaborate a bit more about on this ability of applied, and maybe not just applied, but anyway, geo, geo STEM to um, enable people to actively participate in stewardship. Maybe give me an example again, give us posterity. There is a colleague who has disease last summer, a geologist from uh, Alberta, running the Canadian province. I've run the geological service there for many years, then in retirement took a PhD in uh, economics. And uh, his last work is about analyzing um, mining sites in South America where a manning site are successfully developed from the company perspective and also from the perspective of the local uh, local people and in this field the terminus technicus is social license to operate social license to operate is a terminus technicus emerging in the mining industry which I find has a far wider application, which means bringing around the uh, people 
table all concerned people and agreeing in consensus building yes we will do this mining site yes we know there are environmental problems to it these are the measures that we agree to protect us against the environmental risk these are the social benefits which we would like to have for example in terms of uh, work these are the things which you company will do when you close the mining site in 20 years uh, so that's an entire process it is far away from perfect when you look into the literature you find a huge amount of literature around it and um, he shows in his uh, book that there are successful examples to operate that process and some advices is what to do and what not to do uh, at this particular example uh, building uh, building mining mining sites um, so yeah, that's as far as I can give an, give an answer to this. And for the rest, I have to, you know, I do not like to uh, uh, apologize, but that is the front line of, um, of working. You see, we started with the geoethical geo concept as something which was for professionals, for, of professionals, for professionals. Um, catching up a development which in other uh, domains was done uh, decades before. We moved from that into saying, okay, we can have a societal application uh, for it. And the, we are just now on the forefront to elaborate what could that means in, uh, in practical, practical terms. Uh, in last year was a, uh, a conference in Porto about geoethics and geohydrology. 300 contributions from different people around the globe uh, looking in a wide diversity of subjects, including uh, how these, yeah, for example, an example from uh, Mozambique, uh, where um, exploration site have been protected by military do I cooperate with the military in the situation where don't cooperate with the military in this situation what do i do if i have trade-offs of uh, different user interest there was a lot of 95 percent of the contribution to this conference was about responsible geohydrology only a very small uh, part of contribution looked further beyond. Uh, um, for example, there was a lawyer uh, looking into how existing uh, international agreements could be used in order to uh, formalize certain rules. Uh, so that is, uh, that is the forefront. So, Alberto, I leave you with the swath, getting an answer to, uh, to your question, how to get uh, operational. Uh, basically, I repeat myself, the basic message is you damned guys from the other disciplines, take your second degree, a master in earth sciences, in order that you can uh, apply your competence in economy, apply your competence in, uh, in other social domains, no understanding better how this planet, uh, planet works, how natural how physically and chemical natural system systems work. Huh? You, you know, there, there might be a, 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 an opportunity, and uh, we can discuss this at some other time, but um, we are planning a, a proposal on in a, environmental inequalities, and specifically on two types which are related to energy and they are related to mobility and the two appear to interact in the sense that uh, uh, in, in many cities uh, and uh, a colleague has talked passionately about the case of Norway right now in many cities you, you've got the combo of uh, uh, obligation to go for passive heating in buildings, retrofit even, yeah. which makes city center accommodation very expensive. 
And then from a separate direction, you have another policy which says uh, pollution charge. So vehicles are prohibited from entering the city unless they are electric. So that means that in, in, uh, in some of these cities, if you're, if you're not uh, fairly uh, affluent, you cannot live there because you can't afford. And you can also not go there because also you can't afford the Tesla. And so that produces, uh, in the data, it shows up in a pattern of geographic discrimination. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you can uh, plug uh, um, the geosciences so that you can plan your policies in a way that they will meet your goals, but being mindful of the distributional uh, effects and also non-distributional environmental justice aspects. For example, uh, in representational, in which uh, certain voices are ignored, and this is, is thought to create trust issues at a societal level and erosion of trust and whatever. So I, I, I don't yet see in, in op an operationalization of of of, uh, of this, uh, but uh, this is because probably because I don't have that uh, master in me, in my second master in, in uh, earth sciences. But it would be really interesting to look into that. Uh, so yeah, just um, I, I think I, I, I'm seeing signs that you're kind of getting impatient and you need to close the call, but uh, remember, make a note of this and we can we can have a separate discussion about this. Uh, yes, Alberto, I show certain signs simply because of my next meeting at a different place starting in 37 minutes. I have to pick, pick up my car at a, another place and I have to check operations at that place that they went today uh, to uh, and have have time to talk to people. So no, this, is, uh, this is um, this is getting tough now. Yeah. <laughs> Therefore, uh, if you could uh, refer this discussion, uh, which I'm willing to take uh, to take up, uh, I think I don't have the answers to yet because we are just at the forefront. Uh, some people moving into that direction, and the one paper which I mentioned is really uh, the most advanced for the time which we could do. And you will, when you read it, you still will find it very. Uh, abstract yeah but that's also me and my way of uh, functional working because uh, i believe deeply in the, the in the statement nothing is more practical than a good theory yeah which by the way is uh, check for lancelot bix and the next time i tell him i tell you uh, a joke about lancelot bix uh, no back Takes away. This is a science fiction figure from the 1950s. Lancelot Biggs. Biggs. Okay. And he claimed, okay, I tell the joke, he claims uh, nothing is more practical than a good uh, theory. The story goes as following spaceship, male crew. That's the first scene. Second scene, cook dies. Guys pull sticks who has to do the cooking. Lancelot has to do the cooking. Next scene, desperate male thinking about the bad food which you have to eat for the next three months. Yeah. Next scene, fantastic food on the table. People turn to Lancelot Bix and say, Lancelot, how did you manage it? Oh, yes, you see, cooking is just basic chemistry and physics, and nothing is more, more practical than a good theory. <laughs> Okay, no. Which, by the way, is correct <laughs> when you think about cooking. It's basics, physics, and chemistry. <laughs> to a large degree, to a large, look, it, there's literature about it. Why certain cooking steps are done in a certain order and why they only work in that way. And that's yes. chemistry, this physics. And that's the same why you should do your master in earth sciences. Yep. There's this bye crazy, bye. bye. There's this crazy former uh, head of Microsoft Labs who moved a made a lab in his house and produced this insane cookbook yeah. um, that follows the same principle. I mean, it's yeah. like five hundred dollars or something. It's completely mad, but like the perfect way to cook this, the perfect way to cook that, yeah. and he just had chemists and whatnot producing the book. 
Okay, I run now. Sorry, bye, bye. I will see you again. Martin, bye thank bye. you for this. I will be watching the recording. Thank bye you, bye. Martin. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao.